in the, in, in the last uh, video, Thomas over here on my right, you can see he's right next door to me. How are you doing, Thomas? Uh, went and did a, an amazing job of giving us an entire scope of history, six to 700 years of it all in one video. I'm sure you're all exhausted, uh, as, as am I just listening to that. But what a good way to get an, a capsulization of all the geopolitical, theological disputes and debates, and also what was happening on the ground with the Persians and the Christians and the Byzantines and the Sassanids and the Hassanids and the Lachmids and you name it, it was done and all the major players. And now what he's going to do, he's going to go back to the seventh century. And rather than just look at what was happening politically on the ground, he wants to now unpack what was happening theologically. He wants to look and see what were the theological groups, because there was no uh, religion called Islam that early. And there was no real group called Muslims or, or a person called Muhammad who was confronting Byzantine Christianity, not that early. There weren't even any caliphs, as he said in the last video. That name didn't even come, wasn't even really used until the ninth century. But certainly there were people who had theological positions. And this is quite normal. This has happened right through the last 2000 years of the church, where we still even see that today. And especially there are people that do not like the idea that Jesus is God. I mean, look at the Jehovah Witnesses today. Uh, that would be a prime example in the 20th century. Charles Taze Russell has created an entire sect called Jehovah Witnesses against that idea. Islam is against that idea. So where did this anti-Trinitarian viewpoint come from? It obviously did spring out of uh, out of the air because this is an Arian controversy. This is what they debated back at the Council of Nicaea when Athanasius took on the Arianists back in the fourth century in 325. So certainly this is nothing new. This has been around since the fourth century. We're now in the seventh century, 300 years later, and this obviously raised it he its head once more. So Thomas is going to unpack that. He's going to show us what the debate that was going on within the church in that part of the world, which then led to what we know today as Islam, a very much an anti-Trinitarian uh, religion, a very much an Aryan religion, a religion that believed that Jesus is not God, he's nothing more than a prophet. Thomas, this will be great to have you back again. Over to you. Oh, thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, as you just said, I mean, I've been talking a lot about Syrian anti-Trinitarian Christians, so now it's finally time to look into it. Who were these people? Where did they come from? What did they believe? Um, yeah, and we we'll should go straight into our presentation, I guess. Okay, so who, who are these Syrian anti-Trinitarian Christians? And last time I started in the year 250, today I'm actually starting even earlier, um, at the early second century. because That's when we get our first glimpses into who these Syrian anti-Trinitarian Christians are, where they come from. Um, it's Still, so there aren't really any uh, writings um, left. Oh, yeah, they didn't leave any behind because, yeah, well, they just weren't copied. And um, there's this survival bias, right? So there, um, the what would later become the Catholic Church would obviously only copy um, or mostly copy stuff that would uh, align with their uh, theology and not something that they would deem heretical, right? So there's this survivorship bias. So we don't have any direct sources from the second century, but we can piece together a little bit. Um, and one way of doing it is at looking at Syrian theologians of the time, even though they weren't anti-Trinitarian, but who still had this, this Syrian um, mindset, if you will, uh, were, were taught, taught in this Syrian tradition. And one of them is, for example, the one who's on the picture right here, and that's Ignatius of Antioch. He's um, the third patriarch and bishop of Antioch after St. Peter, and he died around 115 AD. So we're really early in, in the church history. And even though he is not a anti-Trinitarian, um, there are some things that in his writings that, that sort of um, give us a hint. So for instance, he believes very much in a theology of proving oneself. Um, so proving oneself in the eyes of God by following in the footsteps of Jesus. So that's something we will find out is like a very, very important part of, of this anti-Trinitarian um, belief. Um, also, what we see is some terms being used. So for instance, um, Jesus is the servant of God. 
that's that's a title that is quite common in in this early Syrian um, Christian community. It doesn't it, and it but sort of disappears over time in in the in the within the church because it has this connotation: if you're the servant of God, then you can't be God. Right? Um, it still exists, even I think in the Bible today. But it's understood differently. It's not understood in that way. But in, in Syria, it would be understood as well. He's a servant. He can't be, um, can't be, can't be God himself. Um, exactly. Also, what is typical for this uh, Syrian um, Christianity is it's usually in confined in small communities, and it's preachers who like. Uh, move around from from town to town, sort of founding small little communities. Um, these these Syrian Christians, so unlike the Greeks, so um, yeah, at the same basically we have, we have sort of this Syrian side of Christianity and the Greek side of Christianity, and you know, Greek and Latin. But we're looking at the Greeks because that's that's the area we're in. And they both both those groups have very different approaches to uh, to religion in general. Um, so the Syrians, just like all Sem Semitic cultures, or like the Jews, they have they are more oriented in history and not in the nature of God or man or the cosmos. So, so what do I mean by oriented in history? Um, so God, in their view, acts in history through the prophets and through Jesus. Um, and it is sort of your responsibility now to understand what God does and why he does it and what does it like and, and draw your conclusions from it like what does he want from me um, and Jesus now offers the, um, sort of a template so his life is, is the perfect life sort of the, the perfect life is as God would want you to live yours so you follow in Jesus footsteps you prove yourself worthy in the eyes of God right by following uh, in Jesus footsteps um, yeah, and that's also that's how salvation is achieved in in this uh, Chris, um, Christology. So it's not by the sacrifice of Jesus or by his incarnation or anything like that. It's by proving yourself worthy by following in Jesus' footsteps. So they and they are anti-trinitarian and strictly monotheistic. Uh, so they they reject this idea of of a trinity. Um, although like. All of what I said, it's still quite blurry at the beginning of the of the second century, right? But we actually do get a better picture um, with this guy. So on this picture, you see, like, well, this is a 18th century rendition of <laughs> Paul of Samosata, um, and he he is like one of our best sources for this anti-trinitarian Christianity. Um, he was actually the Bishop of Antioch in, uh, well, he was made Bishop of Antioch in 258. And at that time, the Bishop of Antioch was one of the highest positions um, that you could have in, in Christendom, right? So there was, maybe the Pope was still, was already slightly above him, like the Pope in Rome, but then basically it was already the Bishop in Antioch. That was one of the most important um, yeah, um, Christian communities and hence their Bishop was one of the most important figures. Um, so I think at that time it was basically three cities: it was Rome, Antioch, and um, Alexandria, uh, where, where so the, those three bishops were made up uh, the, the highest ranking ranking church officials, if you will. I mean, it wasn't really like a church structure as we know it today, but people would look up to them, and they would have like their voice would have a lot of weight. Um, However, he was denunciated at two synods in Antioch, once in 264 and 268 for his Christology. So that also, that tells us two things. A, he was popular enough in his, his, his form of Christianity, was popular enough to make it to the top of sort of the church in Antioch. But there was also a lot of pushback against him. Um, he rejected a physical interpretation of the title Son of God. Um, he believed that God is unique and, yeah, well, he rejected the Trinity. And now I'm going a bit into uh, the logos, right? So I, I hope most people know, but I, I want to give you a quick background on what the logos is. So logos is um, a Greek word with uh, a lot of 
different possible translations. Now, usually, typically, when you, when you read the Bible, it's translated as word, right? You know, but it's not in Greek, it's not a word in the grammatical sense. That would be lexis. Um, but still, um, in, in philosophy, this has a long tradition. So going back in the sixth century BC and maybe even before that, it was used to mean something along the lines of reason or reason debate. Um, but really for, for the Christians, what, what may come interesting for them, or actually before the Christians, it's the first one who brought this concept into the, into the realm of sort of this Semitic landscape was Philo of Alexandria. He was a Jewish philosopher and um, sort of the post child of Hellenized Judaism. And he followed this platonic, these platonic ideas of um, the distinction between perfect form and imperfect matter. So God is like the perfect form and earth is sort of imperfect matter. And there's a large gap in there which needs to be bridged. And for Philo, this, this bridge was the logos. So that for him was the highest of the intermediary beings. So there are also angels and cherubs and um, yeah, but the Logos was the highest of these intermediary beings, and he called it the firstborn of God. Uh, and this Logos also acted on behalf of God in the physical world, and Philo identified it with the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. As the angel of the Lord, Philo thought this would be the Logos. And Philo believed that the Logos was God's instrument in the creation of the universe. So some of those things might sound familiar, some maybe not so much. So... Obviously, in Christianity, we have the Gospel of John, which starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word is the Logos, right? So oftentimes, also, it's not translated at all because translating it as Word is sort of limiting, right? It's so very often, it's just, um, you can also read it, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was, was with God, and the Logos was God. And for Trinitarian Christ, uh, Christians, the Logos is Jesus Christ, right? or rather Jesus Christ is the incarnate Logos. Um, exactly. But that's something these anti-Trinitarians would reject, right? I mean, they, they worked a lot with this term Logos. That's why I'm bringing it up. Um, and in we have those documents from the synods in which Paul was denunciated. So that's why um, we have a good idea of what he believed in. Um, so Paul believed that the Logos is only an instrument of God. So similar to Philo, unlike um, Trinitarian Christians, he believed that the Logos inhabited the prophets and Jesus. Um, so they, he says they dwell in them, but in Jesus, this connection was deeper than in the previous prophets. He rejected Jesus' pre-existence, so he's um, not the Logos incarnate. He, he says that Mary didn't give birth to the Logos, only to the man. Right? So um, he's not divine. Um, Christ became great through wisdom in his view. Right? So he's, he's like us, but better in, in, in every way. And that's why this connection to the Logos was so deep within him. So, um, yeah. so Jesus became the Christ in Paul's view. By or through his obedience, and by that he means through learning the scripture, through following the law, he achieves wisdom and obedience. Um, yeah, so it's not part of his nature. It's not that he was born divine, born like born as the incarnate logos. Um, yes. So that's that's sort of um, the the gist of it. So this this logos comes up again and again. And you, you mentioned Arianism before. Um, Arianism originates from the same milieu, but it's it's going in a slightly different direction because what Arius did is he sort of, he added a little bit Hellenism to this Syrian um, uh, Syrian belief system. So for, for Arius, Jesus was indeed the Logos incarnate. It's just that Arius also maintained that the Logos was created, so like Philo so that the Logos would be subordinate to God, and hence Jesus would be subordinate to God. But Paul would, have, would also reject this idea. He would say, no, Jesus is not the Logos incarnate. The Logos is sort of a, 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 um, a, a tool or, or, or a force emanating from God, 
um, not not like a, a separate entity as such, and it, it dwells in Jesus. So that's what what Paul Samosata would believe. Now, when we look at Persia again, so there we see the Christianization. The first the first Christian evidence that we find in Persia is actually around um, Aramaic speaking synagogues. So that's why we can sort of assume that it was the Ebionites, so those are the, the Christian Jews or the Jewish Christians, whichever way you want to phrase this, so that they were the first to proselytize in Persia, but they soon sort of disappear. Um, the main the, the bulk of, of Christianity in Persia comes through um, a trade, so along those trade routes, um, obviously religions typically spread, and that's also what happened here. It happens, happens via the deportations. That's a very important part, which we talked about last time. Um, but also by emig emigra emigrated people who, like, um, whenever there are persecutions in Rome, people would move to Persia, basically. Or at least if they live close enough to the border that it becomes feasible. Um, because also, if they just move into, over into Persia, they're also Aramaic-speaking people. Right? As, as we've seen last time, it's one big cultural area. Um, so it would be easy for them for, for them to move back and forth. Exactly. Um, now, from the second century onwards, what we also see in Persia is spread of Gnosticism, um, which was both influenced by Hellenism and Persian tradition. So now that's something, if it was something completely different, it's also technically or often under the, the Christian umbrella sort of, but that's like its its whole own, own little thing. Um, so then in the third century, Manichaeism develops in Persia. That's a, a new, a syn synchronist religion with a lot of Gnostic influences. Um, and it becomes sort of a main rival for Christianity for, for quite some time. And it actually spreads from, uh, yeah, from Asia to Northern Africa and Italy. And I think they're even in, in Spain and in, uh, they, found, they found evidence of, of Manichaeans. So at some point, at one point, it was really um, a big competitor, but then eventually it also uh, waned away. Um, but what's now more important for us and, and the development of Islam is that in the second century, this radical ascetic Christian sect uh, forms in Syria, the, the so-called Encratites. So they are often very anti-Jewish. They are, well, yeah, ascetics. So they reject the consumption of alcohol. Um, they have uh, very strict laws, um, particularly on women. So. Um, yeah, these, these, this is a Christian sect, again, anti-Trinitarian Christian sect that forms around this time. And in that context um, is the Diatessaron is written. So the Diatessaron, that's, the, that's a, a gospel. So it's a, uh, a gospel, it's a narrative woven out of the four canonical gospels, but it's like a single narrative. And it's written in Aramaic. And for the longest time, this is the only Aramaic um, gospel out there. So most Aramaic speaking Christians would use the Diatessaron for centuries. Eventually it gets banned as heretical and then um, the, the canonical gospels are translated into Aramaic as well, but that, that's still centuries away and it only affects the Byzantine Empire, not the Persian Empire. So in, in Persia, the Diatessaron basically is used until, until the end, um, at least by, by those Syrian Christians. No, um, starting to 50, the Roman Emperor Decius systematically persecutes Christians. Again, many, many move and flee into Persia. Um, during the third and fourth centuries, Syrian and Greek Orthodox strains become dominant. So now that's in the West, however. Right? So in, in the Byzantine Empire, the Syrian anti-Trinitarian Christianity sort of dies out after the Council of Nicaea. Um, for them, like after Nicaea, there's really no, no way to go for them. So Paul Samosat, he was still before the Council of Nicaea. He could become bishop. After Nicaea, that would have been impossible, right? There's nowhere to go for them. So again, these people then move into Persia. 
um, or, or convert, I guess, but a lot of them move into Persia. Um, and in the fourth century, we can really say that by now really Christianity has established itself in Persia. We have lots of, we know of lots of bishops. It's it's still in the fourth century, not as hierarchical, it's not, not as structured, not as a, okay. Um, fleshed out structure is in the Byzantine Empire, but it's getting there. It's, it's getting there. Now, in 410, we have this Council of um, Seleucia Tessiphon, which we've also talked about last time. Um, and the, what this means is now the Church of the East is sort of officially separated from the Church in the West. Right? So it's now it's separate. It's um, sphere sort of yeah um, however the church of the east does adopt the council of nicaea um, which means it's trinitarian and that's most likely a result of in of the Syri of the persian christians being a mix of greeks and syrians um, because with those deportations there were also a lot of greeks or greek christians being deported and until, up until 410, they, they basically had completely separate um, church structures. So they were not intermingling. They had the, but the Greeks and the Syrians in Persia had their own congregations every, like throughout the empire. And that's obviously not something that the Persian king liked. Uh, he wanted one, one church for Persia, which would be sort of um, put in opposition to the church in, in the West. Um, and this would also would be a, this turns out to be a Syrian church because the Syrians are the majority, but the Greeks need to be, need to be on board. So that's probably why they um, adopted the Council of Nicaea. Um, and also even like um, from the West now, the, in, the, in the Byzantine Empire, the Syrians already sort of were getting to the point where they were all Trinitarians. Um, and that was also then now moving into Persia slowly. So it was just like, a, it was the smart move to do, I guess, um, to go Trinitarian because that, that's the majority of, the, of, your, of your Christian population, but not everyone. And that's important because there were still um, anti-Trinitarian sects who were, were then very much alienated, right? So up until 410, they were just regularly doing, doing their, their church service and everything. And now all of a sudden this, this, church organization comes in and wants to take over and tell them that they can no longer sort of uh, live their anti-Trinitarian Christianity. So they actually, they uh, maybe radicalize is too strong a word, but they, they isolate and they um, become resilient, if you will. Um, yeah, so at the same time in the West, what's also important to note is that the Byzantine Church declares this Nestorianism, heretical so Nestorianism. Uh, I guess I also need to go to that uh, uh, real quick. So Nestorius, he postulated that we have to separate strictly between Jesus, the man, and Jesus, son of God, basically. Uh, he says these are two separate natures which um, do not mix in any, any way. Um, and this really escalated when he said that Mary is not the mother of God, which was like a very popular title for her at the time, but she's the mother of Christ. You can't call her mother of God. And that's uh, what really caused big uproar. And then Nestorius was deemed a heretic and his teachings heretical. And as it turns out, the Church of the East sort of adopted his teachings. So the, the Byzantine Church saw the Persian church as heretical, but at the same time, the Byzantine church wasn't unified either because the um, monophysitism um, was winning over in, in the south. So coming from Egypt, the Egyptians were basically always monophysites, and it also caused a bit of a rift within, a bit of a rift within the Byzantine empire. And now the Western Syrians, they also become monophysites, whereas the Eastern Syrians are now mostly Nestorians, but we still have our Syrian anti-Trinitarian Christians there uh, in between. And that's sort of the situation 
it right when the Quran appears. And I think next time we're gonna talk about that, how, how that happens, what, what informs this the Quran, and what what of this Syrian Christianity we can find in the Quran. Okay, thanks so much. This is helpful. This is good. This is just putting together another piece of the puzzle, bringing it all together. And, and it's good what you've done. You've kind of shown where this anti-Trinitarian thread has existed all the way from the second century. So this is not something that was just invented uh, in the fourth century. And it certainly was not something that suddenly just came into being in the seventh century in that part of the world where Islam began. It's been there all the way along. That thread has existed from the very beginning. So mm -hmm. there was, uh, I, I was glad how you kind of zeroed in on Paul of Samosota out of Antioch, who was the bishop at that time, who was anti-Trinitarian. So you can see there was a strong influence of anti-Trinitarianism that was there uh, from the second century. Uh, and how that many of those that were persecuted moved over into Persia. <clears throat> but what was fascinating, uh, even those who were persecuted by the Romans also moved into Persia, and that was the Trinitarian. So you had both of this mix, this mix going on up until the seventh century. And you brought this together when you uh, showed that you have the Eastern and Western churches, uh, the, that, that Trinitarian flavor was there, but the anti-Trinitarian flavor was there. You had the Monophysites mm -hmm. were there. So you had all these different groups, uh, the Nestorians, the Monophysites, and the anti-Trinitarians all in that mix leading up into the, into the seventh century, all in that area where Islam is now going to form. That's the soup that we're talking about, and that's the soup that makes sense. Uh, you've got to see the main players that are there. Now, it is fascinating as we're going to move on. It looks like the anti-Trinitarians are going to win out in that battle, and that's how Islam is going to form. And that's going to be the subject you're going to go into when you look at how the Quran was put together and the influences on the Quran. So that's for our next video. Thanks so much, Thomas. Good to have you back again. Good Thank you. Have you continue with this series. We'll see how people respond to it. We've got to put all these different pieces together because it is, uh, it is, this is the, this is the area that most people are confused by. So I hope you're starting to see the threads. I hope you're starting mm -hmm. to see the elements that are coming together. I hope you're starting to see the mosaic. That actually, is coming up. I, have, I have one, one more point, or actually a question, maybe for you, or maybe, maybe for, for the audience. It's something that occurred to me when I was really trying to figure out a way of how to, to talk about the logos, right? And what occurred to me is that this, you could phrase it the different, uh, you could phrase it in a way which I hadn't thought of about before, which sort of caused me to think about something else, but okay, I'll just get into it. <laughs> so the way Trinitarians would see it is like the Logos is not uncreated, right? And therefore, because the Logos is uncreated and God is uncreated, both have to be God, right? You can't, because you can't have two gods. So that's sort of, um, the reasoning for the Trinity, whereas the Antichrist chance they would reject this idea of the logos being uncreated, right? So for them, the logos is created. Okay, and then I, th I thought, wait a minute, there's something else that's believed to be uncreated, and that's the Quran in Islam. Mm. So I was wondering, how do Muslims deal with this, the Quran being uncreated and God being uncreated? Does it mean they have two gods? Does it mean they have sort of a duality? Or how do they square this circle? Well, that is squaring the circle. And this is a, it this seems is what, to me exactly like what they what they accuse sort of Trinitarians of, like having having two uncreated um, beings, right? But that, but the same is true in Islam. Yeah, and this is was brought up. Uh, you mentioned in the last video, Mamun. You know, Mamun, the Mutazilites. Yeah. Mutazilites bring this up. Uh, they exactly. brought this very problem. How do you have chapter eighty-five, verse twenty-two? Chapter 85, verse 21 and 22 of the Quran, which would have been the Quran by that time in the ninth century. By that time, that verse was a striking, and, and, and the Mutazilites said, how can you have an uncreated Quran? How can you have the, the, this, this, uh, these tablets, these preserved tablets from which the Quran is derived? How could that be uncreated? Because that creates a duality. You now have committed shirk, the unforgivable sin. And they were eradicated, uh, and that's why they were all killed, and they were destroyed. And Ijtihad was then closed for a thousand years. So that was a real problem, and it's still a problem for Muslims today. You cannot have an uncreated Quran, which it means that means there's two uncreated beings, God himself and the Quran. One is an, an object, and the other is God coexisting together eternally because there's no longer God as one. And so you can see why the very thing that they're, the anti-Trinitarians are claiming about the Logos 
which is interesting mm-hmm. because that's the same argument that Jehovah Witnesses come up with when they look at John 1 1. They take out Hologos. They don't think that they, that they don't know their Greek very well. Hologos, the God, and they just make it to a God. And so for, for do, in doing that, many times when you confront the Trinitarian formula, the very thing you're confronting, you then accidentally do yourself by including a verse like chapter 85, verse 22 in the Quran. Great stuff. You pulled it out. And I think that is one of the internal difficulties that many Muslims aren't, do not know how to deal with. And many of the debates on the Trinity with Muslims always zeroes in that point on that point of the duality that's there in the Quran itself concerning the uncreated Quran. Good stuff. Anyhow, we do, okay. need, to, yeah. we do need to bring Sorry. this to an end. Yeah. But this is good for it because we are now finding that the soup, the political soup is similar to what is going on with the theological soup. Both of these milieus are percolating there in an area, and I remember, an area that really had no real control. There is no Byzantine control in this part of the world in the seventh century. Heraclius, who destroyed the Sassanids, then pretty much gave it back, pulled back and let the Arabs take over. And the Arabs are now, they have this freedom. They've been waiting for this freedom. The Arabs are both Trinitarian and anti-Trinitarian. And so now we're going to see, well, then how did the book, how was the book put together? Uh, That's next. And so Mm -hmm. Thomas is going to move into that area in the next episode. Until then, get your comments below. Come back at us. Let's see what you have to say. And let's see where we go from here. God bless you. Thanks again, Thomas, for coming on board. Thank you. Thomas and Jay, 4,000 miles apart, over and out.